I, I normally, when I introduce individuals in this kind of a context, I try to go through a fairly lengthy bio and take the things out that I don't think will be terribly interesting. And I tried that with uh, Lord Moncton's bio and found I really couldn't do it because there's nothing uninteresting in there. So I'm just going to give it all to you because it's very impressive. Christopher Walter Moncton, third Viscount Moncton of Benchley, Brenchley, excuse me, is a world famous writer, columnist, business consultant, and inventor. He served as a policy advisor to one of my personal heroes, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, from 1982 to 1986. He was educated at Harrow School and Churchill College, Cambridge and University College, Cardiff. Lord Moncton has argued against anthropogenic climate change in many venues, such as the Cambridge Union, and has published papers in scientific journals and newspaper articles on the subject. He has drawn attention to the lack of a scientific consensus on climate change, calling it, quote, unscientific freedom-destroying nonsense, unquote. He sued to get, quote, the great climate ch change swindle uh, shown in schools in the UK as an alternative to former US Vice President Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. In 2007, in a series of ads he ran in the New York Times and the Washington Post, Lord Moncton challenged Gore to a series of debates on anthropogenic climate change. To this day, Gore has not responded. Also in 2007, he issued an analysis and summary of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth assessment report on climate change. He speaks at climate change conferences around the world, arguing that the theories of man-made global warming are deeply flawed in their science and have led to profoundly bad public policy. It is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce to you Lord Moncton. Welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. Hello, Minnesota. I'm practicing to run for president. I understand that all I need is a nice, freshly minted Hawaiian birth certificate. Tom, after that magnificent introduction, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Now, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change doesn't do simple. It wouldn't call a spade a spade. It would call it a one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust yet adequately efficacious lignometallic composition <laughs> designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilization on the part of hourly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural, or constructional trades or industries, as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may from time to time be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, expedient, desirable, apposite, or germane with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task or objective in hand, or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary General. A horse goes into a bar, and the barman says, why the long face? Because it's a horse, you idiot. <laughs> Most of the points I'm going to be making to you today will be as blindingly obvious as that, because one of the curious features of this debate, which you will have noticed yourselves, and I'm very pleased to see so many of you who have turned out on a cold night to come and hear this, is that the Forces of darkness, I call them the bedwetters for convenience, <laughs> have managed to make the absurd seem obvious and the obvious seem absurd. And so we are going to turn that back and make the obvious obvious once again. Now, one thing I'm not going to do in this presentation is to say that we can screw up the environment as much as we feel like, that we can just make a mess and pollute and take profit from messing up the planet. And I thought that film we've just seen made the point very well that it is, in fact, the richer countries that keep a cleaner environment. If you go to the former Soviet Union, or still worse, to China, or to India, the filth and pollution 
are indescribable. Why? Because the poverty is monstrous. The same in Africa, the same in parts of South America, in the great cities like Mexico City, Sao Paulo. Terrible filth, squalor, and pollution, and death from pollution. And we don't want pollution, we want a clean planet. And therefore, we do not want, for we are all environmentalists, we all love the planet that the good Lord has given us, and, and he's given us the stewardship of it. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 22. Very clear what our obligations are as stewards of the planet. We are to look after all that is in it and over it and under it and swimming in the sea. And we are not, therefore, to exercise that stewardship given to us by our Creator in an irresponsible fashion. Therefore, it is important that we do not waste money, effort, time, or resources on non-problems, such as global warming, as I shall show you that it is. Now, the gentleman you see on the Iraqi banknote there, flourished a thousand years ago. He is Abu Ali ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Haytham. And he was one of the foremost mathematicians and scientists of his day. And in those days, scientists were rather beautifully described as seekers after truth. And he said, the seeker after truth does not simply believe in any old consensus. He checks. And that's what the scientific method is about. It's about checking. Now, one final preliminary point. This card was produced by George Monbiot, a kind of fun environmentalist in the UK, a true believer in the global warming superstition, who believes that I am one of the 10 most dangerous global warming skeptics on the planet. So he produced playing cards, and I am the Nine of Diamonds, known as the Curse of Scotland. And you'll see me there dressed up in my Gilbert and Sullivan attire, but you, I can assure you I've been paid not to sing tonight. <laughs> but one point I do want to make is that you must not believe a word I say. I am not Al Gore. I am not going to tell you what the truth about the climate is. I am simply going to tell you a series of facts from the science and the data and the peer-reviewed literature, and I am going to allow you to draw the conclusion for yourselves that there is no problem with the climate. I am not here to proselytize or preach. I do not expect you to believe me because science is not a belief system. Science is a rigorous process of inquiry, and I'm going to work you quite hard tonight. We're going to get through a lot of slides, a lot of data, a lot of facts. I make no apology for that, because I want to show you just how strong the case is against the pseudo-scientific gibberish, which is perpetrated by the UN's climate panel and Al Gore at Hope Genus Omne. And I'm going to show you the latest science, which now doesn't leave the question unsettled anymore. This is now settled science. It is now settled science that there is not a problem with our influence over the climate. The science is in, the truth is out, and the scare is over. Now, just a quick straw poll before I start on the scientific bit. How many of you here believe that global warming is any kind of global crisis? I'm looking now, and I can't really see. There are two or three hands only, I think, uh, are raised, three or four hands only, believe that global warming is a, a global crisis. Well, the first thing I will say to those four or five of you is that it isn't a matter of belief. It's a matter of science. It's a matter of hard work finding out what is true and what is not. That's what we're going to do tonight. There won't be rhetoric. There'll just be boring fact after fascinating fact. Now, I'm going to start by talking about why the truth really matters. Quesivit enim Pilatus, quid est veritas? Et ita dixit iste gubernator judee, quia dixerat ille salvator mundi, ego in hoc natus sum, et ad hoc veni in mundum, ut testimonium per hibeam veritati. Unto this was I born, for this came I into the world, that I might bear witness to the truth. 
Now those words of our blessed Lord are a perfect mission statement for anyone who, like me, has had the honor to play a part in the formation of public policy. We are there to bear witness to the truth. We are not there to impose any ideology, whether free market or anti-free market, whether communist or libertarian, on the truth. The truth is the truth, whether you or I or anyone believe it or not. And here is why the truth matters. It was all very well for jesting Pilate to ask that question and then not to tarry for an answer. But that question that he asked, what is the truth, is the question which underlies every other question. It is the only question in the end that really matters. When you ask a question, you are really asking, what is the truth about the matter I'm asking you about? And we are now going to see why it matters morally, socially, and politically, as well as economically and scientifically, that the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth should inform public policy on this question. Now, 40 years ago, DDT, the only effective agent against the malaria mosquito, was banned. And you saw in that film what the effect of that ban was. Before the ban, the inventor of DDT got the Nobel Prize because he had saved more lives than anyone else in the history of the planet. Malaria, one of the greatest killers of children in the third world, had all but been eradicated. There were still 50,000 deaths per year. But when DDT was banned, by exactly the same faction that is now trying to tell us we must close down five-sixths of the United States economy, that figure is actually in the Waxman-Markey bill, that same faction banned DDT worldwide. The consequence is on the slide there. The number of deaths went up from 50,000 a year to a million a year and stayed there for 40 years. 40 million people, nearly all of them children, died of malaria solely and simply because DDT had been banned for no good scientific reason or environmental reason whatsoever. And it was only after every single one of the people responsible for that dismal, murderous decision had retired or died, that on September the 15th, 2006, Dr. Arata Kochi of the World Health Organization said, normally in this field, science comes second and politics comes first. But we will now take a stand on the science and the data. And he ended that ban on DDT and made it once again the front line of defense against the malaria mosquito, after pressure from me among others. But the left, the environmental left, the intolerant, communistic, narrow-minded faction that does not care how many children it kills, is campaigning once again for DDT to be banned because they do not want children to be born in the third world. They want as much of humanity as possible, it sometimes seems to me, to be wiped off the face of the planet. And there is a better way to control population than to withdraw the one effective agent against one of the world's biggest killers. And that is to raise the standard of living of the poorest. That has long been a moral imperative. Since the time of our blessed Lord himself, it has been a moral imperative that we help our lords the sick and our lords the poor. And we work for them and we raise them up and we make them healthy and we make them wealthy. Because if we make them wealthy, then their populations will stabilize. This is something that every demographer knows perfectly well. Make the population wealthy and it stabilizes. Keep it poor and it will continue to increase. Make it poor if it was wealthy and it will start to increase again. And if 
the environmental left were really serious about saving the planet from a huge CO2 footprint, which, as I shall show you, doesn't matter at all, then the first thing they would do is pursue policies that would not, as the extinction of five-sixths of your economy would do, make you poor. But they would be trying to make everybody rich. Here is another catastrophic decision taken by the same faction, and that was when HIV first appeared, your specialists at the US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, US AMRIAD, recommended to the Surgeon General, privately, for they were not allowed to make public recommendations, that HIV, a new, fatal, incurable infection, should be treated just like any other fatal, incurable infection, and everybody who got it should be identified and isolated immediately, compulsorily, and permanently, but of course, humanely. That policy advice was rejected under pressure from various, once again, factions of the left who did not care how many people died, and the result is on the screen there. Since that time, 25 million dead, most of whom need not have died if that policy had been followed, as it had with smallpox and other diseases that are fatal. Smallpox now eradicated, but AIDS not eradicated. No cure in sight, and 40 million people that we know of, and heaven knows how many that we don't, infected and doomed to waste away and die. And in third world countries, that is a big deal. Sub-Saharan Africa, 7.5% of the population infected. All because, once again, the decision recommended by the sound scientists who had actually studied the effect of the disease on the population was not taken. Instead, a decision was taken that had nothing to do with the science. It was a political decision, it was a wrong decision, and it murdered tens of millions. That's why it matters to get the policy right. Here, let's take it down now from the millions just to one person. This lady, pictured by Reuters, contracted HIV from her husband. She passed it on to two previous boys who died. The boy you see here, visibly sick at her breast, died a month after this photograph was taken. She died a year later. That's what it means if policymakers are careless or reckless or they pursue political agendas without regard to the cost, sometimes for people in faraway lands of whom we know too little. People who depend utterly upon us to get these decisions right. The responsibility of policymakers, therefore, is an honorable but also an onerous one. It is for us to get these decisions right. And that is why I am here today, because I want now to talk through with you how we get the science and the economics of this global warming scare right for good and all, so that those few of you who still at the moment think we do have a problem, and I entirely respect your opinion and understand where you're coming from in view of the way the media and the politicians and quite a few scientists have misled you, I'm going to show you how you can find out and work out the truth for yourselves, for the truth alone is worthy of our entire devotion. Here is what happens if we get it wrong. This is what is already happening in third world countries all over the world because we decided that global warming was a problem. We decided to take one third of the agricultural land of the US out of growing food for people who need it and instead we devoted it to growing biofuels for clunkers that didn't. And the effect has been the doubling of world food prices in just two years, according to the World Health Organization, and also according to the World Bank, which has done a survey to explain this sudden jump in world food prices. Now, for us, paying $2 instead of $1 for a burger is an inconvenience. For the people in Haiti, like the gentleman you see here, who are living at the moment on mud pies made with real mud, they were paying three cents each for those mud pies 
and those mud pies were just about keeping them alive. The price of world food doubled. The price of mud pies doubled. I told this story recently at a conference in Madrid of government and opposition leaders. And a lady in the front began crying. And I said, I'm sorry to distress you. And she said, I've just come back from Haiti. Now they can't even afford the mud pies. There have been food riots in a dozen regions of the world in the last two years. You will not have seen these food riots reported almost anywhere in the West. Let's just have a, a head count. How many of you have seen these food riots reported? A few, but only a few. How many of you have seen those food riots reported with the same enthusiasm and repetitiveness as you have seen the global warming scare reported? Not a hand goes up. Of course not. So, there is the energy policy that Africa is now suffering under. The energy source is timber, energy transmission on the backs of the poor, energy use in smoke-filled huts with no proper chimneys where the children die of smoke-related diseases. That is the fate which those who believe in the climate scare would not only like to remain in Africa, but they would like to inflict that upon us as well. It is as crazy and as wicked as that. So now we come on to what I'm going to flash through very, very quickly, because there are just so many of the lies that are being told by those peddling this scare. You will be able to determine for yourselves very easily that these are lies. I'm going to show you that they're lies, and you're going to then be able to check, because copies of my presentation on disk, with each slide shown and each slide annotated, are available from the organizers of this event, and you just get in touch with them, and it'll help to raise funds for them. They won't be sending any funds to me. This is funds for them. They'll sell you a disk, and you can look at each of these slides in more detail later. But I am going to go through them very, very quickly now. So first of all, then, here is a few instances of where they tell you that they're going to lie. This is the first chairman of the UN's climate panel, science panel, Sir John Horton. He wrote in a book on the subject, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. Stephen Schneider, who says, we have to offer up scary scenarios. Then Stephen Gilbo of Greenpeace, global warming can mean colder. It can mean drier. It can mean wetter. That's what we're talking about. Where do they find these people? And then we have, of course, our old friend Albert Arnold Gore. I believe it is appropriate. I can't do his dreadful accent. <laughs> I believe it is appropriate to have a, an over-representation of factual presentations on just how dangerous it is. Why does anyone, for a single moment, believe anyone who uses language in a mangled form like that? <laughs> now, here's a little test for you. Who is the first who will tell me what is visibly scientifically wrong with this poster for Gore's movie? The words in yellow are my words, but the rest is his poster. What is visibly wrong with it? Yeah, what's wrong with the graph? Let's hear it. That's right, you have a re-entrant. Under the word all there, if that was temperature or CO2 against time, it could not possibly kink backward like that. <laughs> the whole line on that graph was drawn by a PR agent, not by a scientist. The rest of Gore's movie was written by PR agents and not by scientists. Let's just look at a few of the mistakes in that movie. Here, for instance, are the Nan Laz, which Al Gore it was found by a UK High Court judge to have perpetrated when we took this film to court. And we said to the judge, this mawkish sci-fi comedy horror movie 
should not be shown to innocent schoolchildren unless these lies have been corrected. And the judge, in that custard-faced voice that they all have, said, quite right. <laughs> I'm not going to go through each of these lies. There isn't time. And there's another 35 of them where this came from that we didn't have time to put in front of the judge. But this was enough to establish the principle that 77 pages of corrective guidance had to be sent by order of the judge to every school in England before innocent children could be exposed to this utter drivel in the film. We're going to look at just some of that drivel now. Here, for instance, is the sea level la, where what Al Gore says is he says, right, the melting ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland are going to raise sea level by 20 feet imminently. Now, in fact, the other side tried to say he didn't mean imminently, but we said, yes, he did. Look at the way he's showing the sea, wiping out Manhattan and San Francisco and Bangladesh, and the whole of Holland would disappear. It's wonderfully sort of, it took very expensive graphics to do that these maps showing the disappearance of the, of the land bit by bit as the sea level inexorably rose by 20 feet, wiping out existing populations. But actually, even the UN's normally excitable climate panel says that those ice sheets will only contribute two inches to sea level rise over the whole of the next 100 years. That's what the science says. But this is what the judge said. The Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. And the judge, of course, was quite right. And Gore knew the judge was right because in the year he made that movie, he spent $4 million buying, yes, some of you have got there already, buying a condo in the St. Regis Tower, San Francisco, just feet from the ocean at Fisherman's Wharf. So how many of you think that as he went in through 20 feet of sea level rise through the doors of that building, he would not find himself going glug, glug, glug? I mean, it is monstrous that a man who does this, who knows perfectly well that sea level is only going to rise by around 8 inches to 16 inches in the whole of the next century, depending on whether you believe Professor Nicholas Murner, who's written 520 papers on the subject, or the UN, who says the 16 inches. It's, it's, that's all it's going to be. It's actually not risen at all in the last four years, as we'll see later. Then there's the polar bears, la, where he quotes a scientific paper saying that polar bears are dying all over the shop because of global warming. Here is the actual paper that he was quoting from. Monet and Gleason, 2006. Four dead polar bears, and why did they die? Nothing about global warming in the entire paper. What the paper said was that there had been high winds and high waves in a bad storm. In the technical language that we climatologists like to use, shit happens. <laughs> so I checked, and the Beaufort Sea, where these four polar bears died, has shown, if anything, a slight increase in the amount of sea ice available over the last 30 or 40 years. So there's no basis whatsoever for his suggestion that the polar bears were having to swim up to 60 miles to find ice. The whole story was a fiction. And as the film you've just heard said, the population of polar bears has increased dramatically since the 1940s or 1950s, somewhere between two and five times. We don't know exactly, but it's certainly a huge increase in polar bear population, hardly, as you may think, the profile of a species in imminent threat of extinction. And as the movie also said, this is an example of a logical fallacy. In fact, it's one of the Aristotelian canon of logical fallacies. It is the argumentum ad misericordiam. We feel sorrow for the polar bears because they're cuddly, and therefore global warming is terrible. There is no logic in that. It's all emotion. Then there's the Kilimanjaro la. And this one, he says that Mount Kilimanjaro has lost a lot of the ice on its summit because of global warming. So being a dull, boring, scientific person, I checked the satellite records of the temperature 
on the summit of Kilimanjaro over the last 30 years, which of course covers the period you see there. And here it is. And that red line shows how dramatically the temperature on the summit has increased. In fact, it's hardly increased at all. And what has happened on the summit is that, in fact, there's been regional cooling in that area, which has dried the atmosphere so that the ice is ablating. It's not melting. It can't melt because the average temperature on the summit is minus 7 Celsius. That's about 12 or 14 Fahrenheit degrees below freezing. And even the maximum temperature is well below freezing, about 3 Fahrenheit degrees below freezing, the maximum temperature ever reached in that period. So what's going on? There's the cooling. That's from NASA showing the cooling in that region. So whatever else was causing the ablation of the snows of Kilimanjaro, it certainly wasn't any kind of warming, whether global or other. And all of the scientific literature makes that entirely plain. Look, for instance, at Molg et al. 2003. Plenty of papers on this. And most of that ice had already melted by the time that Hemingway wrote the snows of Kilimanjaro in 1936. In fact, the ablation began in 1880, and indeed many of the glacial recessions that have been observed around the world began in 1880, some of them even in 1820. Most of the melting that has gone on has gone on long before humans could have had any influence over the glaciers whatsoever. And here then is my message to Al, I'm still waiting, Al baby. You want to debate me? No, you don't. But if you don't debate me, you're a coward. Recently, I was invited by the ranking minority member on the Energy and Commerce Committee of Congress, Representative Joe Barton, to come to the United States and testify in front of that committee alongside Al Gore, who had been nominated by the Democrats as their witness, and I was going to be the star witness for the Republicans. For the first time in the history of Congress, the ruling party rejected the minority party's choice of witness. It's never happened before, apparently. They didn't want me to testify, me, a non-scientist, to testify against Al Gore. I wonder why not. Now some lies from the UN's climate panel itself, because it's all very well poking fun at Al Gore, but he's now, frankly, just a bit of a joke. But now we get on to the serious business. This is the body which is supposed to be representing the true facts about the science to the world. But of course, it's not. It's just another vested interest lobby group. The first thing they did was, in 1995, Ken Overpeck talked to David Deming, a scientist who's expert in reconstructing past temperatures, who'd had a paper successfully published in Science for the first time. Overpeck congratulated him. Deming told the story 10 years later. And he said, we have to get rid of the medieval warm period. Now, Overpeck is one of the UN's scientists. We have to get rid of the medieval warm period. Not we have to check whether there was one, check how big it was, check where it happened and where it didn't. No, we have to get rid of it. And here is how they did it. There you will see the 1990 UN reports graph. I've colorized it a bit. I've spelt medieval correctly, but otherwise I've left it alone. <laughs> and you will see the medieval warm period uh, up there on the left, a kind of camel's hump, it's very clear. You can see the little ice age uh, in the middle there, and then a tiny little pimple on the right, which is today's temperatures. Not exactly an exciting picture, but they were quite honest in the 1990 report. There was the medieval warm period. But then, 1995, Overpeck comes along and says, we have to get rid of the medieval warm period. Here is what they did by 2001. Same graph, but this time, no medieval bump, and look what has happened to temperature in the 20th century. A huge surge. How have they done that? Notice the small words, northern hemisphere temperatures. They left out the southern hemisphere, because if they had, they wouldn't have been able to exaggerate by 50% the warming of the 20th century, as they've done on this graph. So there's a double lie in this graph. One, no medieval warm period, when everybody knows it exists, and the science is clear on that. Two, they were able to exaggerate by 50% the warming of the 20th century. Here's how they did it. First of all, they said, right, we are going to use what are called proxy data sets. These are things like tree rings and 
sediments from lakes, and we're going to analyze them and see whether the width of the tree rings vary and so forth. We reconstruct temperatures before instruments were available to measure them. And what they did was every time they found a data set that gave them a hockey stick shaped curve with a nice flat shank going back a thousand years and then a huge uptick in the 20th century, they said to themselves, ah, we'll give that 390 times as much weighting as we will give to those data sets which show the inconvenient truth that there wasn't this huge surge in the 20th century like the one at the bottom there. Both of those, incidentally, are tree ring data. 390 times as much weighting for the one that suited them as for the one that didn't. That was the first thing they did. Then they used an algorithm for proce processing all these data sets, a computer program for plotting the graph, which would draw hockey stick shaped graphs even if you put random red noise into it, that's a kind of random data. Not even the real data, just random data, it would always produce that convenient shape for them which abolished the medieval warm period and exaggerated the warming of the 20th century. But that wasn't enough. Even when they tried both those techniques, the trouble was the medieval warm period kept on still showing up. So then what they did was, if you look at the faint line there, you can see that's what their data uh, would have showed. They, they, they tried to remove the actual data for the medieval warm period from certain key data sets. They replaced it with estimates of their own that removed that inconvenient medieval warm period. And they didn't say in the paper that they published in Nature that that was what they'd done. Instead, they said they'd used the actual proxy data. So they actually lied in print. And it was two Canadian researchers who forced them to, to publish a belated lame corrigendum admitting what they had done. That is the length to which the UN has been going actually to tamper with the data that is available to us. And now here is the truth about the medieval warm period. Here are just a few papers, the eight or nine of them, out of the papers contributed over the last 20 years by more than 700 scientists from more than 400 institutions in more than 40 countries, establishing that the medieval warm period was real, was global, and was warmer than the present. That is the scientific consensus, if you do science by consensus, which the UN says it does. But on the question of the medieval warm period, the UN refuses to accept the scientific consensus. Instead, it uses made-up graphs, and it is still at it. This graph appeared a week ago in an update by the UN's climate panel just in time for the Treaty of Copenhagen, about which I shall have a lot to say later. This graph is not taken from the literature, it's not taken from the data. It is taken from the most unreliable source on Earth, Wiki Bloodypedia. <laughs> and when this was spotted, they very quickly took it away again and substituted a different graph, which didn't show the disappearance of the medieval warm period. So they will lie and lie and cheat, and even when they're caught out, they will continue to lie and cheat. And here's another one. I spotted this one. The day of publication of the UN's 2007 report, they published this graph, which had not been in any of the versions of the report which had been seen by the scientists. The final draft report by the scientists did not contain this graph or anything like it. This was inserted by the bureaucrats because I had leaked to the Sunday Times that the final draft report which we had seen had, had revised downwards the UN's upper estimate of sea level rise in this century from more than three feet to less than two with a best estimate of about one foot five. And they were furious that we'd pointed out that they'd had to admit that sea level wasn't going to rise anything like the 20 feet that Al Gore had imagined imagined, or even the three feet that they'd tried to imagine before. They were furious. And so they inserted this graph without checking with the scientists, and they thought we might as well multiply by 10 the effect of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica on global warming. So they did. They just moved the decimal points in four places. But being dim as well as dishonest, <laughs> they failed to add up the four new figures correctly, so I spotted that the total at the bottom wasn't right. It wasn't even within a factor of two of what it should have been. 
So I got on to four different UN officials on the day of publication, and I said, this is unacceptable, you are to correct it. So very furtively, they moved the table, corrected it, relabeled it and called it something else, put it somewhere else in the report, and furtively posted it up on their website without issuing any statement that they had made any correction to the final published draft. That's how dodgy these people are, even when they're caught out. And for that, I wear with pride my Nobel Peace Prize pin. I too, Al Baby, <laughs> am a Nobel laureate, but I got it for telling the truth, and you got it for telling lies. So, the 2,500 IPCC scientists lie. The IPCC, this is the UN's climate panel, it says that 2,500 scientists participated in this dismal report they've just produced in 2007. Al Gore last week in Madison, Wisconsin, inflated that to 4,000. The number of scientists who actually contributed to the crucial chapter of that report, which says that most of the warming of the last 50 years was our fault, was 50. The number of reviewers who rejected that conclusion was 60. But the IPCC's documents are not peer-reviewed in the accepted sense. If the reviewers say, this is rubbish, but the authors say, we are sticking to the line, and this is what we're going to say, it's the authors who prevail. And they paid no attention to the reviewers. But also, we now introduce the main question to which we need to know the answer in order to decide whether we have a climate problem or not. In policymaking, the art is to, is to distill an apparently complex question into something simple that we can actually answer. And that question is this, by how much will the world warm in response to a given proportionate increase in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide? That's the central question. Everything else is dross, because if the answer to that question is not very much warming, then all the scare and all the other problems that you see all over the UN's reports and all over the media fall away, baseless. Now, the UN cites only four scientific papers in support of the values of the three parameters which, when multiplied together, yield final climate sensitivity, the amount of warming you get for a doubling of CO2 concentration. Just four papers written between them by about a dozen researchers. Not 2,500 and not 4,000. Now we come on to a lie in the 1995 report, and this is one of the most extraordinary lies of the lot. Time and again, the scientists in that report said, we cannot find any anthropogenic or human signal in the climate record. We are having no effect on temperature as far as we can see. They said it five times very clearly. Here's one sample of it, here's another. And now watch this. Here is what the bureaucrats did. They rewrote the final draft, yet again, after it had been cleared and signed off by the scientists, to say the exact opposite. The body of evidence now points to a discernible human influence on climate, and that has been the official line ever since. Here is the latest lie in the 2007 report, the iconic lie there. They're attempting to show that global warming is accelerating. Implication that our CO2 emissions are accelerating, and this is causing a more rapid rate of warming. This is a statistical lie known as the start point or end point fallacy, where you take a jiggly up and down data set like temperature, or you don't know which way it's going to go next, a stochastic data set. If you choose your start points and your end points carefully enough, you can make it look as though any trend you want is happening. Here they've tried to show a rising trend. I'm now going to take the same data, but I'm going to take the more recent end of it, between 1993 at the present, and I'm going to choose my own start points. Look at this. Top left, 1993 to the present. Top right, 2000, uh, 1997 to the present. Bottom left, 2001 to the present. Bottom right, 2005 to the present. We're heading for a new ice age. <laughs> now, 
Now, here is a question for you to see whether you've been concentrating as alertly as I hoped. Which of those two graphs is nearer to the truth? Hands up for the UN's graph. None, I think. Hands up for my graph. A few. Hands up for neither. Much more. And those who said neither are correct. Because remember, I started out by saying, this is a bogus statistical technique. Every time you use it, it produces results which could only be right purely by accident. It is invalid whether you do it to try and show a falling temperature or you do it to try and show a rising temperature. And I merely gave you that example to show how easy it is to bend the data in the way that the UN has done. And it is a disgrace that a public authority in receipt of taxpayers' money from around the world should dare to produce a graph like that one that we've just seen. That should never have been done. It is a clear, continuing instance of deliberate bad faith. And now here is the truth. Do you know that the guy who runs the science panel of the UN's climate panel, is he a climatologist? Nope. Is he a physicist? Nope. Is he a mathematician? Nope. He is a railroad engineer. So we have removed his railroad lines from this graph, and we've added his lordship's much grander purple lines. And you'll see they all run in parallel. And what that means is that the warming rates from 1860 to 1880 and from 1910 to 1940 are exactly the same as the warming rate from 1975 until 1995 when all global warming stopped, and there hasn't been any since. So there is no anthropogenic signal whatsoever in the temperature record, just as the scientists correctly concluded in 1995 before the IPCC, the UN's climate panel, rewrote their paper. So now just a few lies from the scientific community. Who can guess what kind of a lie I'm illustrating here? Anybody? Yes, it's our old friend the start point fallacy. They decided they would start this graph just in 1970. The intention being to show that hurricanes are getting far worse because of global warming. And that's what the paper concluded. So I, being dull and boring and scientific, went and got the rest of the hurricane activity record. <laughs> so we go on then to uh, a lie which was told by the Director General of the National Climatic Data Center, Tom Carl, when he and I testified alongside each other in front of the Energy and, Co and Commerce Committee of Congress earlier this year. I produced this graph. I'm sorry that the text is not entirely clear, but what I'm saying here is that there has been global cooling for the last eight or nine years. Statistically significant and rapid cooling. How many of you have seen that reported in any major news medium recently? Not many, no, not even one, perhaps. There you are. They don't tell you the elementary facts about the climate. And when I produced this graph, the ranking minority member, who had prearranged this with me, put on a wonderful act. He said to Mr. Carl, he said, Mr. Carl, why have not you or any agency of the US government in receipt of taxpayers' dollars told us in these months of hearing about global warming that for nine years, ever since the turn of the millennium on the 1st of January 2001, there hasn't been any global warming. There has been rapid, statistically significant global cooling. Or is Lord Monckton lying to us? And Tom Carl flannelled. He wouldn't admit that global temperatures had fallen. This was not on message. So I was asked to write to the committee and explain how I came to produce that graph. So I told them I'd taken the average of four data sets and combined them, and that's what came out. But I said, I realize you could ask questions about my technique, so let's simplify it. Tom Carl is the director of the National Climatic Data Center. 
Let us produce a graph which just shows the data from his organization only. Now watch this. Not much difference there, I think you'd find. So we move on then to the consensus lie. You are told time and again, aren't you, that unless we do something drastic about the climate, then there will be disasters, plagues, boils, pustules, frogs, toads, you know, something out of one of the Psalms. That's what you hear. The scientists are all agreed. Our Al Gore said it again last week. No scientist, he says, disagrees with me. So I checked. I'm boring that way. I keep checking things. That's what scientists do. That's what Al Haytham said we should do. I check them. So I got a colleague who had access to the ISI Web of Science database, a very distinguished scientist called Klaus Martin Schulter in London, to search all papers published between the beginning of 2004 and the beginning of 2007 using the search term global climate change. 539 papers were identified on that subject. It's a good way of choosing papers randomly. He read them all. And here is the number of papers offering evidence, any evidence at all, of any catastrophe arising from any anthropogenic effect on any part of the climate anywhere in the world. Yep, zero. That's the consensus. And the consensus, so-called, does not even agree with itself. You will see on that chart three separate IPCC estimates of the answer to that central question I raised earlier, how much warming for a doubling of CO2. 3.8 Celsius, no, 3.5, let's make it 3.26. And now they've just announced, the, the person whose value they relied on for that 3.26 has now said he got it wrong, it's too big, they're going to have to bring it down again next time. They don't even agree with themselves. And here is another nice dodge. You take a temperature record going back 100 years, but that's inconvenient because it shows global cooling, or actually it shows uh, local cooling, of course, at Santa Rosa. This is our old friends, the NOAA, again. And so what they do is they process the data. They leave this end of the century alone, but the 1930s they alter, and hey presto, we get global warming, just like that. We reprocess the data. There's no scientific basis for doing this. Now, I was intrigued when I came across this, so I had a look at the data from NASA GIST this time for 1,200 US temperature stations. As they had processed, processed it and shown it in 1999, and again in 2008. And once again, the same technique is being used. They are actually accelerating the rate at which they're exaggerating the warming of the 20th century. Because they cannot bear to admit that actually there hasn't really been anything like as much as they say there has. And here is another lie. Nils Axel Murner, doing the most thorough investigation of sea level ever done anywhere in the Maldives in 2004 to 2007, concluded there'd been no sea level rise in the Maldives for 1,250 years. None. And he found this tree in leaf lying on its side on the seashore, but still in leaf. He stood it up to take this photograph. And I'll tell you why he did, because he went away and asked the locals, how come there was a tree lying by the seashore still in leaf? Had the sea surged up and swamped it? Oh no, they said. A team of Australian environmentalists had come past. They'd seen the tree there, 40 years old at least, they'd realized that since it was right by the shore, this would be rather good evidence that there'd be no sea level rise in all of that 40 years. And they knocked the tree down so that nobody else would be able to see it. Just their bad luck that, like the UN's bureaucrats forgetting to add up the bottom of the table, they forgot to take the leaves off. <laughs> and they're lying to children as well. They lie even to children. This book was written and produced by the producer of Al Gore's movie. What she did was to switch the captions on the graphs for temperature and CO2 going back 650,000 years so that she could show that it was CO2 that had changed first and temperature that had followed. When the unanimous opinion of the scientific literature by a very simple series of measurements shows that it was 
exactly the other way around. It was temperature that had always changed first and CO2 had followed. And she wrote the text that you see there, stating this lie, and when we drew her attention and that of her publishers to this lie, they point blank refused to correct it. They didn't deny it was a lie, but they would not correct it. And this in a book for children. So now we move on to the truth about what has been happening to temperatures. You're going to like this. I got this from Professor M. I. Bhatt of the Indian Geological Survey when I was asking him what was happening to the Himalayan glaciers. They're doing fine, by the way. He's got 200 years of records from the days of the Raj when we first began monitoring these things, don't you know? And the glaciers are showing no particular change in 200 years. The only glacier that's declined a little is Gangotri, a very famous glacier, because there's been local geological instability, nothing to do with global warming. All the others are doing fine. Anyway, he kindly tried to indicate to me what has happened to temperatures over the last 300 years. <laughs> a brief history of global warming. <laughs> Give him a round of applause for that one. I mean, <laughs> these scientists have a wonderful sense of humor. They really do. And this is a guy, diligent researcher, really knows what he's doing, loves his glasses, how many of you can tell me how many glaciers debouch from the Himalayan plateau into India? Anybody? Anybody guess? 20? No. 9,575. It's quite extraordinary how many glaciers there are. Most of them haven't been visited. How many glaciers in the world? More than 160,000. Most of them in Antarctica. So let's look on now at the history of temperature then going back 650 million years, 550 million years, back to the Cambrian era, 550 million years ago. Oh yes, I remember it well. <laughs> and at that time, I, I remember this, CO2 concentration was 20 times what it is today. And the amusing thing about that is you hear about ocean acidification, which is another complete nonsense, it's their fallback. They've, they've gone from global warming to climate change. They've gone from climate change to energy security. And they can't go quite from energy security to absolute rubbish, so they're going to go via ocean acidification on the way. Now, what are they doing here? In the Cambrian era, that was when the calcite corals first achieved algal symbiosis, when there was 20 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere as there is today. All we're talking about, all the UN is talking about, is we may be able to double or perhaps even triple CO2 concentration before we run out of fuels to do it with. So there's no way we're going to get to those concentrations ever again. It's clearly going to do no harm whatsoever to the corals. And look at how little correlation there is in that graph between temperature in blue there and CO2 concentration in black. Plainly, CO2 is only a bit part player in all. And here is the last 10,000 years of the, what's called the Holocene warm period. And you can see that most of the time it's been warmer than it is today. And, sorry, went past there. Now this one is the earliest instrumental temperature record we have, the Central England Temperature Record. And it shows between the arrows there that between 1700 and 1735, a third of a century, temperatures rose in central England by four degrees Fahrenheit. They managed just about one degree Fahrenheit in the whole of the 20th century. And the significance of 1700 to 1735 is that that was before the Industrial Revolution began. We could have had nothing whatever to do with that temperature increase. And it is nine times as fast a rate of increase as we have seen in the whole of the 20th century. So when they tell you the rate of increase in temperature is something wholly new, you look at that graph and it's absolute rubbish. So we then go on to the truth about today's climate. Now the curious thing about these truths is that you will not have seen them in almost any major news medium. First we've seen temperature falling, then we see it really is cooling. Then we see that sea level follows, uh, not sea level, uh, Arctic sea ice extent follows a nice regular sine wave curve. 
and each different colored line there is a different year. This year's line is in red, and as you will see, it's just very much where it always has been. There's nothing spectacular about that. You may have heard, because the newspapers have gone on and on and on and on about it, that in the 15th of September 2007, at the summer sea ice minimum in the Arctic, there was about 27% less ice than there normally is. And this was blamed, of course, on global warming. But it was nothing to do with global warming. It was to do with unusually strong winds and currents coming up from the tropics, as a NASA paper records. And you can see there the purple is the sea ice extent in 2007 at the summer minimum, then 2008, and then 2009, where the sea ice extent on September the 15th, just a couple of weeks ago, was 24% higher than it had been in 2007. How many of you have seen that figure reported? No, I thought not. And here then, wait a minute, yes, is Greenland. You have all heard, let's have a hands up on this, how many of you have heard that Greenland is melting away? Yes, that's right, you've all heard that. Right. Here is a paper by Johannesson et al., a diligent Danish researcher using laser altimetry. And what he found was that between 1992 and 2003, the average thickness of the vast Greenland ice sheet increased by two inches a year, a total of nearly two feet over the period. Not exactly what you see reported in the newspapers. I couldn't believe this because I'd, I'd seen so much in the newspapers. I thought, well, maybe we got a bit of um, ice loss in, in Greenland. So I checked. I'm like that. I got in touch with the Department of Defense. I said, I want your pictures of some dew line stations as they were when they were operating and as they are now. And they sent me this. On the left, as they were operating. On the right, as they are now. Gradually being surrounded by ice and firin and snow as the ice sheet builds up and up and up and gets thicker and thicker and thicker. There is visual Mark I eyeball confirmation of Johannesson's result. And then we have Antarctic sea ice, which has actually been rising gently, the extent, over the last 30 years since satellites were able to monitor it. And you will notice a little peak in 2007. That was the peak, the 30-year peak, of our Antarctic sea ice extent. It occurred just three weeks after the sea ice minimum extent over those same 30 years in the Arctic. You all saw the reports about the sea ice minimum in the Arctic. How many of you saw that three weeks later there was a sea ice maximum in the Antarctic? No, I didn't think so. Is this because you're stupid? Is it because you're lazy? Is it because you're just yanks? <laughs> Is it because you're not peers of the realm? No. It's because you haven't been told. And now look at hurricanes. The hurricane activity is a measure of the frequency, duration, and incidence of hurricanes and typhoons and tropical cyclones all around the equator, added up into a 12-month running sum. It reached its least extent in the last 50 years just a few weeks ago. And none of you will have seen that reported either. Now we come on to the science, because I'm going to bring this shortly to a close. We want to know the science now, where it actually stands, because the UN's reports, all four of them, even if they were true, and you've seen how often they've lied, and therefore you suspect, rightly, that they're not going to be true, even if they were true, they are now entirely out of date. First of all, they base their research on computer models. And I'm going to explain to you, because it's worth understanding this, why models must fail. They fail because, mathematically speaking, the climate is a chaotic object. And that's not just a, a term of abuse. It has a specific mathematical meaning, which I'm now going to explain. If you don't know the initial values of the parameters that define the climate object, and there are millions of them, to an extremely high precision, then you cannot make very reliable, very long-term predictions of the climate. What does very long term mean? It means more than a few weeks. It just goes askew. And I'm going to show why. Here is a seriously simple chaotic equation. 
f of z equals z squared, or rather maps to z squared plus c, a complex number. This is an iterative equation. It goes round and round to see whether you get a bailout or you don't. Now, that's <laughs> not that kind of bailout. And mind you, Obama could use this equation. It might help. But what you've got here, I've specified that the values of c to 16 decimal places, both in the real and the imaginary part of the complex number c. And I'm going to plot these bailouts on a picture the same size as that slide. Now, you would think, simple equation, maybe we get a simple output like this. But the trouble with chaotic equations is that they don't give you simple outputs, because you get bifurcations, or phase transitions, as they used to be called. And so just watch the screen now. This is what that really simple equation produces. Now, that's not a drawing by me. It's not a work of art. That is in the mathematics of that equation. That's what comes out when you put those numbers in. You can do it at home on a simple computer. It's not a difficult program to run. And that's the picture you will get. And you can see the sheer complexity. And that's an equation with just one parameter. Now imagine millions of parameters, which is what the climate has. No way a computer model can ever reliably predict the climate. Sunachi Akasofu, one of your greatest climate scientists, has said that no computer can do what the UN is trying to, to get it to do. It just can't be done. The same, he also makes another interesting point. We are telling the computers the answer to that central question, how much warming do we get from CO2? They don't tell us. We tell the computers. And of course, then they spit the same answer back at us. So the computer models cannot tell us the answer to this one question we need to know. Now, I was asked before I came here, what about the sun? Now, the sun is that large yellow object in the sky from which all the warmth in the climate actually comes. It is therefore not implausible to assume it may have something to do with things. Here is the record, and it's a very remarkable record, of what has happened to solar activity as measured by sunspot activity over the past three or 400 years. You'll notice on the left the Maunder minimum, when for 70 years the sun was less active than at any time in the past 11,400 years. On the right, you will see the grand maximum from 1925 to 1995, when it was more active than at any time in the last 11,400 years. A remarkable increase in solar activity, corresponding to a really remarkably small increase in global mean surface temperature. But the solar physicists, you might take Scafetta and West, say, in uh, 2008, they attribute 69% of all the recent global warming to the sun. Most solar physicists agree. The International Astronomical Union in 2004 had a symposium on it. They concluded that that was the case. They said, we're now going to get global cooling because the sun's turned itself off for a bit. And global cooling is what we've had ever since. They're getting it right, and the UN's getting it wrong. Maybe they're right. Maybe it is the sun. But so little has been the change in global temperature over the last 100 years that it might just as well be natural variability. We don't need any other explanation but that. So going on then to, uh, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> one of the things that's just recently been done, not yet published, is that in Japan, for 100 years, they have calorimeters mounted on the surface of the Earth. The sun comes down through the clouds or whatever's in the way, and the calorimeters measure how much sunlight is actually hitting the Earth's surface all over Japan. They have a 100-year record of that. It's shown in red there. And the blue is the surface temperature. There appears to be a correlation between the two, but as you noticed, oops, I'm sorry, in this slide, um, correlation does not always imply causation. As you will see at the moment, we have an appalling deficiency in sunspots and not enough Republican senators in Congress. <laughs> Thought you'd like that. So when I lie, I do make it obvious to you. So now then we have... Uh, another possibility that you need to understand, the fact of warming, which of course stopped in 1995 and hasn't really resumed since, but the fact of warming does not tell us its cause. Every time you hear the environmentalists say, oh, it's been melting in Greenland, therefore humankind is responsible for global warming. That is the Aristotelian fallacy known as the argumentum ad ignorantiam. We don't know what's causing the warming, so we're going to blame it on anything we like. That is not a rational or logical argument. 
and it might just as well be Al Gore with his flamethrower on the surface of Greenland. <laughs> so then we have CO2. This is what it's all about, isn't it? CO2. CO2 now occupies, get this, one ten thousandth more of the atmosphere than it did in 1750. That is all, one ten thousandth. And if we try really hard and don't cut down our CO2 emissions, we might be able to occupy another one two thousandth part of the atmosphere in the whole of the next hundred years. That is all. And here you can see the actual record of CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere taken by NOAA. I think they got it right this time. And you'll see the IPCC zone in blue there, and the inset projects it out to 100 years. And you'll see that the little thin pale blue line is well below the IPCC's exponential curve because it's only rising at a linear rate at the moment. That one measurement, that one circumstance, requires all of the IPCC's temperature forecasts to be divided by two because there just isn't going to be that much CO2 in the atmosphere, even if we don't make any reduction. And now the sea is cooling. Now this is a serious blow to the official theory because it is agreed among all parties that the sea should be warming. It should be getting hotter. It should be accumulating heat energy. But it isn't. We now have 3,319 Argo bathythermograph buoys deployed throughout the world's oceans. These are very expensive bits of kit. They, co they cost many tens of thousands of dollars each. We have to renew 800 of them every year because they get hit by ships, swallowed by whales, bumped into by Greenpeace vessels. <laughs> and they have to be replaced. And these go down to depths of a mile and come back up and they report the temperature and salinity at all depths. And they fire off a signal to the satellite and back they down, down they go and do it again. They're carried around the world on the ocean currents. And the, the university that runs this keeps a map of where they all are. It's the most reliable and most expensive method of temperature measurement we've ever done. And throughout the period of measurement, which is six years, the oceans have been cooling. The heat energy is not accumulating there. And as a result, sea level over the last four years, that little red arrow at the top there, is hardly increasing at all. It was increasing at a dizzying rate of one foot per century. Now, not at all. Not what you see reported in the newspapers. And recently, a very important paper by Douglas and Knox, two very distinguished professors. I've had the pleasure to lead a seminar on climate sensitivity at their university. They've just produced a, a very fascinating paper in which they've gone back and look at all the levels, all the uh, heat energy figures for the oceans of the world, going back 68 years. And they find in that time no net accumulation of heat energy in the oceans whatsoever. And what that means is that if you put double the CO2 in the atmosphere, it is barely going to make any difference to global temperature. The NOAA, of course, disagrees. But how does it get away with disagreeing? First of all, it leaves out all the Argo data. Well, it's not convenient. It goes the wrong way. They leave out all the satellite data. It does the same. And they rely only on the data from ships dropping canvas buckets down as they randomly pass across the oceans and pulling up some water and sticking a thermometer in. And only then can they make out that ocean heat is accumulating. That's how they do it. They bend the data. They don't use the latest techniques because the latest techniques are producing answers they find uncongenial. So then we have a little experiment for you to do. I want you to squint at this screen now through your lashes. Which bits can you see? The white bits. Those are the clouds. They reflect light back into space. If the planet were to warm, you'd get more clouds and more light reflected back into space, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. So the UN says the opposite would happen, that the, the Earth would heat up because you get more radiation coming down in there. And there is no scientific basis for that conclusion at all that, as it's called, the cloud albedo feedback is positive. It is, in fact, very strongly negative, as a paper just about to come out by Roy Spencer at the University of Alabama at Huntsville will testify. And here is why. 
There is the fundamental equation of radiative transfer. This is the only equation you can use if you want to convert changes in the amount of radiant energy in the atmosphere, trapped down here, as we're told, by CO2, into changes in temperature. Any mathematicians present? Not even one. Good, I can get away with everything then. <laughs> right. Now, what happens here is if you look at that equation, the radiative flux, F on the left, is balanced on the other side by temperature raised to the fourth power. What that means is you have to have a very large change in radiative flux to get a very small change in temperature, which is no doubt why the UN's climate panel in the, hundred, in the 1,600 pages of its 2007 report and in the 1,000 pages of its 2001 report does not once mention that fundamental equation. It's the only equation that can do for them the job of answering the question we need the answer to, and they do not mention it once, because they know what it shows. Any mathematician looking at that can immediately see we don't have a problem with the climate. If we apply that equation to this question of whether the clouds building up would make the Earth warmer or cooler, we get an extremely clear answer. It would make it cooler if you had more clouds. I'm not going to go through this calculation now. You'll be glad to hear. Anyone who's nerdy enough to want to follow it, get my slides and read the text underneath. Now. Here is another dreadful departure of the computer models, these Xbox 360s that the UN uses, from reality. All these models predict, they have to, because you can't otherwise pretend that CO2 has a huge effect on temperature, they all predict that in the tropical upper air, there will be warming at three times the surface rate. And here you can see that prediction. Uh, there it is, man-made greenhouse warning, middle on the left, various other forcings, combine them, bottom right, and that man-made forcing still predominates. But that's the prediction. Here it is again, more predictions from different UN climate models. They all predict this tropical mid-troposphere or upper troposphere hotspot. You have um, latitude from left to right, south to north, and altitude going up. So you can see it's in the tropics, in the upper air, there should be this tripling of the surface warming rate. Now, the inconvenient truth about this particular prediction is that we can check it by doing a boring thing called measurement. What we do is we send up radio sondes on balloons which report back what they find in the way of changes in temperature, or we fly up in a plane and we drop drop sondes, or we try and do it by satellite. Now, all of these are subject to a certain amount of uncertainty, but here is, what the, I'm sorry, here is what the data actually show. That is the real-world data produced by the Hadley Center, founded by Margaret Thatcher, God bless her. And you'll see there, question mark, that's where the tropical upper troposphere hotspot isn't. <laughs> Not there. It's all gone off. It's absent. And why is it absent? because there is no theoretical reason why it should be there. It's an invention, it's a fiction of those who are trying to make out that CO2 has a huge effect on temperature. How do they get to this fiction? Well, what they do is they say that as the Earth warms up, and this is quite correct as far as it goes, it doesn't go far enough. As the Earth warms up, so it is capable of carrying near exponentially more water vapor by another proven result, which they're w willing enough to mention, the clausius clapeyron relation. And as a result, you get more water vapor, and at those high altitudes where the absorption bands of water vapor are not saturated, if you put more water vapor there, then that will stop the radiation getting out. It'll be trapped there by various molecules, mostly of water vapor, and therefore you will get warming there. That's why that is predicted. However, a recent paper by Paltridge et al. come out just in the last few months, 2009, finds that what happens is that the extra water vapor as the world warms up there subsides by its own weight to lower altitudes where the absorption bands of water vapor are already saturated and therefore no additional or very little additional warming is caused and therefore no differential in the warming rate between the upper troposphere in the tropics and the ground. That too is fatal to the official theory and we now know why, thanks to Paltridge, that that fatal observation is true. So we move on. 
we do a little math check. Now, if you take away the whole atmosphere, I love doing experiments like this, be bold. We take away the whole atmosphere, the cryosphere, the biosphere, and the hydrosphere. Take them all away and just leave the lithosphere. A rock, the same kind of composition as Mars, the same distance from the Earth and the same size uh, from the Sun as it is now. What would be the surface temperature? We use that magic equation, the fundamental equation of radiative transfer at the, at the emitting surface of a planetary body. It tells you immediately what the temperature is. And it's only 33 Fahrenheit cooler than it is today. What does that mean? It means that the entire greenhouse effect of the entire atmosphere, once you net off the albedo effect of the extra clouds that appear, is only 33 Fahrenheit. That's the entire global warming effect of the existing atmosphere. And now what the UN is trying to tell us is that if we alter one two thousandth of the composition of the atmosphere over just the next hundred years, somehow that is going to have the same effect as one sixth of the existing atmosphere. That is how totally absurd the high climate sensitivity value assumed by the UN actually is. And now we're going to prove it. And I'm going to ask you a very simple question. I'm going to ask you, if we warm up the surface of the Earth, does the amount of radiation coming out from the Earth and going back into space at the top of the atmosphere, A, increase, B, stay the same, or D, C, I'm sorry, decrease? Hands up for an increase in response to warming. Quite a few. Hands up for no change in response to warming. One or two. Hands up for a decrease in response to warming. One or two. And hands up those who have not voted so far. <laughs> Thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're an honest audience, because what you're saying is you don't know. Now, that is an interesting experiment to me. I've not yet found an audience that did know, and I speak on this stuff all over the world. Why don't you know? Because you haven't been told. We've been through that. That is the most important consideration. Because we have to know, don't we, whether or not radiation is being trapped in the Earth's atmosphere by all these extra greenhouse gases, perhaps reinforced by extra water vapor as the, as the Earth warms. That's what it's all about. And yet we can't answer that simple question. And why can't we answer it? Because we have not been told. They do not wish us to know the answer. We're going to see why they don't wish us to know the answer in a moment. Here are 11 Xbox 360s. Here we have 11 models. Temperature going from left to right, and on the y-axis, the vertical axis, the outgoing radiation. As you can see, as temperature increases from left to right, the models are all told to predict, they don't work this out for themselves, they're told to predict that the amount of outgoing radiation will diminish. So those of you who put your hands up for diminution, you are at least reflecting the official position as the models are told to believe. But once again, and this is completely fatal to the official theory, once again, we can measure, can't we, how much radiation is getting out from the Earth's atmosphere. And we can correlate it, can't we, with changes in temperature at the Earth's surface, because we can put a satellite up there and just watch. And we had to wait 20 years to get enough data to do this right. And it was done and published just last month by perhaps the greatest living climatologist, Professor Richard Lindzen of MIT. How many of you have heard of him? Then I want you to give him a round of applause. Come on. This And I'll tell you why I wanted that round of applause. This man has faced vilification from the left for 33 years. They have attacked him for taking money from oil companies, which he hasn't done. They have said his research is no good. They have isolated him. They've cut him off. But they haven't been able to take away his tenure. He's clung to that by his fingernails and continues to do some of the best academic research in the world on the climate. And he has been waiting 20 years to accumulate enough data from the Earth radiation budget satellite to produce this result. Do you notice, 
Yes, do give it a round of applause. This is the... <laughs> this is the result that brings the climate debate to an end. Even though there are uncertainties in the capacity of the Irby satellite to measure accurately the outgoing radiation, those uncertainties cannot extinguish the difference between what the Xbox 360s predict and what actually occurs in reality, which is that instead of getting three watts per square meter of radiant energy less getting out, as the Earth warms by one Celsius degree, you get four watts per square meter more getting out into outer space. What does that mean? It means that radiation cannot be down here causing the warming that the alarmists are so alarmed and want us to be so alarmed about. It ain't happening. And it is a very simple matter, which is done in the paper by Lindzen and Choi, to work out what that result means for the answer to our vital question. How much warming will you get for a doubling of CO2 concentration? Will it be the 3.3 Celsius that the UN imagines? No, it won't. It will be 0.5 to 0.8. Now, I'm very pleased with that result, not only because, for the sake of the world, we don't have a problem, and now we know it because we've measured it, but also because last year I did some calculations, theoretical ones, based on the fundamental equation of radiative transfer and a number of other considerations. And I calculated that the warming for a doubling of CO2 would be 0.5 to 0.8 Celsius. And the two editors of Physics and Society who published my paper, the commissioning editor and the review editor who peer reviewed it, an eminent professor of physics, were both sacked for printing that result and now it's been confirmed by measurement. I want a round of applause. <laughs> so here are just a few of the errors we've been looking at, and Houston, we have a problem, not with the climate, but with the official theory, which now lies before you in tatters. There is no climate problem. Even the IPCC now admits, as it has since 2001, that climate varies on all timescales, and what we may be seeing may well be natural. Now, let's see what the politicians say about this. <laughs> this is Nancy Pelosi. She is the Speaker of your House of Representatives, and she has recently said this. Thank God that we in America have plenty of natural gas, because otherwise we'd have to depend on fossil fuels. <laughs> Henry Waxman has said that if the Arctic ice melts, all that tundra will be releasing methane into the atmosphere. Just one problem, the Arctic ice cap is entirely over seawater. <laughs> then we have John Holdren, who 30 years ago said we needed a population police to stop all those third world countries breeding. And he also said that we had to do this because we were heading imminently for a terrible ice age and the ice on Antarctica would build up so fast that it would pour into the sea and cause a tidal wave of proportions never before seen in human history. James Hansen of NASA, a figure of complete fun nowadays, predicted in The Guardian earlier this year that sea level would rise by 75 meters. That, in your language and mine, is 246 feet. And look what would happen to the Washington Monument if that were the case. Then we have Arne Schwarzenegger. The debate is over, the science is said, and now we must act. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad we have climatologists like him telling us what's going on. Well, that's the traffic light tendency. They call themselves green because they're too yellow to admit they're really red. <laughs> I must end now, and I'm going to end on a serious note, because there's just one economic point I will make very briefly, and that is that in order to forestall just one Celsius degree or two Fahrenheit degrees of global warming, even if the UN is right about the exaggerated effect of CO2 on global warming, which we now know it not to be, even if it's right, 
you have to forego two trillion tons of CO2 emission. Now, that's the equivalent of 67 years of the world's entire output of 30 billion tons a year. You have to close down the global economy entirely, go back to the Stone Age without even the right to light a fire in your case. That's what you'd have to do just to knock off two Fahrenheit of global warming, so-called. That e that's all you need to know about the economics of global warming in one slide. There's no point in doing anything whatsoever about it except to adapt as and if necessary, which we now know we don't even need to do. That's the end of the debate on the economics. There it is. That's the effect of the Waxman-Markey bill, even if it were implemented in full, which it's not going to be, on temperature and on sea level. And here is the amount of money that's been spent in the last 20 years by your government, your taxpayers, your money, on totally unnecessary climate research to do with global warming. Obama announced in his stimulus package another 80 billion just for the next three years on the same subject. Totally unnecessary, totally wasted. But there are real problems that we haven't addressed, which should be addressed. There's a few of them there. I'm not going to go through them. You know what they are. And what are we doing instead? At Copenhagen, this December, weeks away, a treaty will be signed. Your president will sign it. Most of the third world countries will sign it because they think they're going to get money out of it. Most of the left-wing regimes around the world, like the European Union, will rubber stamp it. Virtually nobody won't sign it. I have read that treaty. And what it says is this. That a world government is going to be created. The word government actually appears as the first of three purposes of the new entity. The second purpose is the transfer of wealth from the countries of the West to third world countries in satisfaction of what is called coyly a climate debt. Because we've been burning CO2 and they haven't and we've been screwing up the climate. We haven't been screwing up the climate, but that's the lie. And the third purpose of this new entity, this government, is enforcement. How many of you think that the word election or democracy or vote or ballot occurs anywhere in the 200 pages of that treaty. Quite right, it doesn't appear once. So at last, the communists who piled out of the Berlin Wall and into the environmental movement and took over Greenpeace so that my friends who founded it left within a year because they'd captured it, now the apotheosis is at hand. They are about to impose a communist world government on the world you have a president who has very strong sympathies with that point of view. He's going to sign. He'll sign anything. He's a Nobel Peace Laureate. Of course he'll sign it. And the trouble is this. If that treaty is signed, your constitution says that it takes precedence over your constitution. And you can't resile from that treaty unless you get the agreement of all the other states' parties. And because you'll be the biggest paying country, they're not going to let you out. So, thank you, America. You were the beacon of freedom for the world. It is a privilege merely to stand on this soil of freedom while it is still free. But in the next few weeks, unless you stop it, your president will sign your freedom, your democracy, and your prosperity away forever. And neither you nor any subsequent government you may elect will have any power whatsoever to take it back again. That is how serious it is. I have read the treaty. I've seen this stuff about government and climate debt and enforcement. They are going to do this to you, whether you like it or no. But I think it is here, here in your great nation, which I so love and I so admire. It is here that perhaps at this 11th hour, at the 59th minute and the 59th second, you will rise up and you will stop your president from signing that dreadful treaty, that purposeless treaty, for there is no problem with the climate, and even if there were, economically speaking, there's nothing we can do about it. So I end by saying to you the words that Winston Churchill addressed to your president in the darkest hour before the dawn of freedom in the Second World War. He quoted from your great poet Longfellow, Sail on, O ship of state. 
Ceylon, a union strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy face.